feels really, really good to be here. And uh, you know, the folks at uh, Mobile World Capital asked me to come and talk to you about my life as an entrepreneur. Can I ask you for a favor? Do you want to put the notes? Can you come here? Rafa. Sorry, they were going to put some notes there. All right. So, like I was telling you, the folks at Mobile World Capital asked me to come and speak to you, and they asked me to talk on the topic of entrepreneurship. And I wanted to, you know, thinking about this in terms of defining what makes an entrepreneur, you know, I started thinking a little on my life and certain things that I've done. And, you know, I put a definition saying that to me, an entrepreneur is somebody who knows how to take calculated risk, who knows how to dream big, who knows who's relentless in, in when they're setting their goals and objectives. And I guess it just decri describes a lot of the folks who are out here today with us in terms of what makes an entrepreneur. You know, also another important topic is us entrepreneurs are people that are not scared to fail. And when we fail, we get up and we try again and we try to get it right, right? Like everything else in the world, you know, a lot of people say to be an entrepreneur, you got to be a big dreamer. And I think it goes well beyond being a big dreamer. You know, you got to have the capability to execute because a lot of times vision without execution is just a failure. And I say, you know, in life, there's two types of people, you know, those who dream big and who the following morning wake up and can do something about the dream or there's something who just let the dream go by. And those who dream and work hard are going to be able to achieve their dreams. And those are the folks that I call the successful entrepreneurs. You know, it was interesting to see, you know, somebody who I really admire, Steve Jobs, and he always used to say that half of the, what makes a, a good entrepreneur is those that know how to persevere. So it's pure perseverance. And lastly, and very importantly, you know, we cannot forget about innovation. Running our companies, running your companies, you have to continuously question, you know, how can you innovate? Hopefully some of the advice that I've told you in the past few minutes will be helpful to you. I mean, it's been extremely helpful to my life. So I want to tell you and share with you a little about my story, you know, and also want to give you a view of, in terms of how can I run my business and how do I continuously innovate my business. I came from a country called Bolivia, which is a small country that most of you don't know about it. And Bolivia is a country that, you know, is not well known for creating a lot of entrepreneurs and is not well known for getting any gold medals or making it to the World Cup. So the first business that I started was when I was 10 years old. I used to buy and sell my mom's clothes outside my house. And then later on, while I was in college, in the university, I started a business of buying and selling frequent flyer miles. And it was definitely a, a pretty enriching experience to me that it gave me the ability to run a business that, you know, it gave me a pretty good lifestyle while I was in college. After college, you know, I really didn't know what I was going to do. So on a flight back to my home country, I got invited to be part of the Bolivian Soccer Federation. You know, and that was definitely being one day, one day out of college, it was definitely a, an enriching experience. And with my partner, the person that invited me, we decided that we were going to do something that had never been done before. And that was we were going to take Bolivia to the World Cup. And for Bolivia to make it to the World Cup is something that traditionally is not supposed to happen. So Guido was the person who invited me, made me his right hand man. We jointly, you know, Bolivia had been trying to make it to the World Cup for the last 70 years. And even though we didn't have any money, we hired the right coach. And it's a coach that taught the players that big dreams can actually move mountains. So we trained twice a day. We trained hard as everybody else. And against all odds, you know, in 1994, Bolivia made it to the World Cup. And that was probably one of the biggest life-changing events in my life because it allowed me to say that if you have a great plan, you know, you are going to be able to make things that otherwise would think is impossible. After the World Cup, I returned back to my country. I returned back to the US. You know, I had no job, I had no money, and I needed a cell phone, so I stopped in a cell phone store. And, you know, I was lucky enough to buy that small shop. It was one shop, and we figured we needed to do things different. So at that time, it was, when well, I was going in college, it was well known that they could deliver a pizza to you in 30 days, or the pizza would be free. So we instituted something very similar to that. We pretty much equipped the whole city with drivers, and we put cell phones there. And then we put a huge ad in the newspaper, and people could call a 1-800 number in the US and be able to get a cell phone delivered to their home in the, last, in the next 30 minutes. That was definitely a game changer in the industry, and that made us the largest cell phone retailer in the northeast of the US. 
So after that, I was able to make my first sale. I sold the company to a, a bigger chain of stores and then I decided that I wanted to start a new company that was focused on supply chain, that was focusing on distributed mobile phones. I had myself suffered a lot from having poor service from the, the current distribution companies that were serving us. So the big idea came and we took that idea to banks and we got rejected and we took that idea to, to some friends who actually lent us some money to start the business. So the first thing we needed to do was choose a name. At that point in time, there were two huge companies. One was called Brightpoint, the other one was called Cellstar. And uh, we decided to form, name our company Brightstar, in which we took part of the name of each of those companies. And we used to tell people that we took the best of each one of them. In the early days, there were the trading days. We we're pretty much a small trading company. You know, that what we did is we found market inefficiencies. We found where we could buy mobile phones in one place of the world and resell them to other parts. We figured out that the trading on its own was not going to be a sustainable business, so we moved to set up a distribution business. We pretty much opened up bright stars all over Latin America, and we changed the game by distributing mobile phones in country. It made it very different. Rather than people having to go to one of the hubs like Miami to pick up their mobile phones, they could buy their mobile phones in their own currency, in their own credit terms, right in their home country. So that was an evolution that we moved from basically a trading company to a distribution company. Then from Latin America, we decided to enter one of the most complex markets in the world. You know, back then was the US market. And in a matter of two years, we became the number one wireless distributor, not only in Latin America, but in the US. And we generated close to $4 billion in revenue. So considering that we had started a business five years back and having run, taken a business from zero to 4 billion was definitely a big achievement. We figured out, you know, being a distribution company that we had a great supply chain and that our supply chain was better than that of our customers. So what we did is we set up a new division called uh, Global Supply Chain Solutions. And what we started doing was running our customer supply chain. We started running, and in a few years, you know, we started running some of the leading Opco supply chain, companies like Telefonica or like Vodafone or Verizon or Telstra in Australia or others. So we started running our customer supply chain. And it was hard to believe that what started as a small trading company today was running some of the most sophisticated supply chains around the world. You know, we had a leadership position in, a, in distribution. We were starting to become one of the leading supply chain solutions company in the world. We had $4 billion. And then we figured out what was next, so that we wanted to continue to grow. So then we came to, you know, we saw that we had a great global infrastructure, you know, locations in over 40 countries. We had excellent customer relationship, and we had a great platform to replicate all the services. So then we decided to get into, we did our first acquisition, which was a very small insurance company out of Georgia in the United States. And we grabbed that insurance company, and insurance means, you know, anytime you lose your phone or your phone gets damaged, and we were able to take this company to a global scale. And if you fast forward, we bought this company three years ago. In this year, we expect to reach and become the second largest insurance company in the world in the mobility space. And we did that by innovating and by basically taking a new service. The biggest driver of profitability in insurance is how do you pay your claims. And at the beginning, anytime you lost your phone, we used to pay our claims with brand new cell phones, and that was very costly. So we decided that we needed used phones that we can refurbish so we can pay customers with a refurbished phone. And we got into what is called the buyback and trading business, meaning after your, after your contract with your operator is over, you know, you traditionally, you know, went to buy a new cell phone. So we are the company <coughs> that buys that used cell phone. And the reason why we did it was to basically lower the cost of the claims that we're going to pay. Well, amazingly, that business has grown. And today, you know, we run the buyback and trading. Anytime you work into a Verizon shop in the U.S. or an AT&T shop in the U.S., that's us. A Vodafone shop in, in Spain or a Vodafone shop around Europe, that's us. Anytime you walk into an Apple store and you want to trade in your phone, that's us running it. So we started a business to basically lower the price of claims and has ended up being one of the largest and fastest growing business that we have. I don't know if you're aware, but there's close to a billion phones sitting in everybody's drawers, and people have realized that there's a value when you turn in those. Then later on, we went into the business of running stores. You know, we had a company in the US called Target who invited us to run their mobility category management. And we learned that you know, we had all the necessary tools that we've learned over the years. So today, anytime you walk into a Target shop in the US, you're dealing with one of our employees. 
Anytime you order a phone in walmart.com, you're dealing with Brightstar. Anytime you order a phone from bestbuy.com, it's pretty much being shipped from us. So that's another area that we expanded. So what we've continually done is develop new service that allows us to expand leveraging an existing infrastructure that we have. You know, we had Verizon who came to us and says, you know, we want to grow the presence within the Latino community. So we did a joint venture with Jennifer Lopez, and we launched the first chain of Latino stores in the United States. That's called Viva. And we already have close to 20 shops that just opened in the main cities like New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. And lastly, you know, our industry is changing drastically. You know, uh, in many countries around the world, in emerging markets, people want to get their latest smartphone, their latest Apple, their latest Samsung, but they cannot afford to make payments. You know, they cannot afford to pay $700 for a phone, but they have the ability to pay a dollar a day or $7 every week. So we launch our financing group, and what we're doing right now is we're giving the ability to people to buy their mobile phone through a microcredit mechanism, and that's definitely helping increase the sales of smartphones in, uh, in Latin America. And in the U.S., we're the ones launching what is called installment billing, meaning you can pay your phone over the course of you know, 24 months. And the reason why we do it is because the mobile phone business is turning very similar to the car, meaning a consumer is leasing a device, and after 12 months, a consumer is going in, trading in their device, and getting a new device every 12 months. So definitely what we've been done with Brightstar is what started as a small trading company you know, had basically grown <coughs> to be one of the leading services companies in the world in the mobility space. And when you fast forward, we've been doing this for 16 years. And what you see in Brightstar, we have a global presence. We're in over 50 different countries. Our sales have grown back when we started. You know, we did a million dollars the first year. This year, sales are going to exceed $20 billion, which makes us one of the largest private enterprises in the world. We have developed a best-in-class service portfolio in which we're managing you know, a lot of business as it relates to most of the leading network operators or most of the leading retailers. And we've been able to finance this business, what I started from borrowing money from friends and family to, doing, you know, to borrowing money from banks to actually raising over a billion dollars in private equity. And lastly, what we did last or operation is we sold 57% you know, to one of the world's leading entrepreneurs to SoftBank Group we sold 57% for $1.3 billion. Now, in order for us to have grown a business, again, that started from selling phones into a tiny store to actually selling more than 140 million phones and invoicing over $20 billion, has definitely been driven by innovation. I mean, what Brightstar is today is something completely different than what Brightstar used to be at the beginning. And we've done that by innovating our service portfolio almost on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis, just trying to bring new services. Now, beyond Bright Stars, you know, I've started also, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're always going to try to push, you know, to do stuff outside the box. And, you know, and one of the things that I've done is, you know, we've joined the board of directors of Sprint, and we're trying to apply, you know, the same methodology that we've learned in Bright Star in terms of figuring out, you know, how can we make a Sprint a more entrepreneurial company and finding different ways, different products and different services that we're going to try to do to try to change the game. And I think that I'm doing personally is I love soccer, I love football, and we are starting a brand new soccer team in Miami, and that's a partnership with David Beckham. And that's definitely a project, you know, that's going to be very, very difficult because uh, soccer has traditionally failed in a city like Miami. But, you know, we do believe that, you know, we have different, you know, we have a different way of approaching soccer with David, and hopefully it's going to be, you know, one of the most successful teams launch in the United States. Now, when I look at what the future is going to look like, and for the entrepreneurs that are in the room, you know, I think there has never been a better or more fascinating time you know, to be an entrepreneur in this industry. When you're going to see and you're going to have a chance to talk tomorrow to the, the, to the folk who started, a, you know, who started What's Up, and that gives you an idea of you know, a, any great idea in our industry that's a sticky, that grows, you know, obviously it's going to reap the rewards. And when you look at what WhatsApp has done, it's pretty amazing. In just five years, you know, they have 450 million users that we communicate via WhatsApp. Now, when you look at that, that's five times the market cap of a company like BlackBerry that had an opportunity a few years back when they had a messaging platform called BlackBerry Messenger. Also, you know, you look at how quickly, you know, our markets adopt new technology. If you go back to 2010, there were zero tablets that were being sold. Fast forward today, there's 200 million tablets. When you look at Uber, for example, is somebody that we know 
that's very close to us. And in 2009, it was just an idea of how, we were gonna, how they were going to change transportation, how were they going to make limos available. You fast forward five years, they're in 70 cities in 27 different countries, and they have a $3.5 billion valuation. So anything that there's a lot of new trends, as long as you're changing or making ways, making the world operate in a more efficient manner, then you're going to get results. And we've seen, you know, in companies like Uber, how just by changing the way you used to call a limo before or you pick up a taxi, they've created a company that has a value of $3.5 billion. Then this is one of my favorites. You know, when you look at Nest Labs, it's a company that pretty much figured out how to automate thermostats, how to connect uh, smoke detectors, and this is Google Centrus into the home. But again, they were very clever in terms of figuring out you know, in this internet of things or in this connected world in terms of how can you develop a product that it could be connected, that could change the world home automation, the way home automation work, and you, can, you see how those entrepreneurs are reaping the rewards and they're able to sell their company, again, for a great amount of money for about $3.2 billion. Another tendency, you know, when you look at this conference four years from now, is, you know, we've been following the Chinese marketplace. And what's amazing, what is happening right now, is we're going to see, not in, you know, how people say China is far away, we're going to see that by 2020, which is almost around the corner, China is going to become the economic leader, where the GDP of China is going to surpass the U.S. So any entrepreneur that's developing products, is developing services, developing applications, you definitely got to look at the Chinese market as it's going to become the most important market. When you look today, there's more LTE smartphones in China than in the U.S. And when you look at the e-commerce market, when you look at companies like Alibaba, today there's, there's more <coughs> e-commerce transactions that are, being connect, that, are, that are happening in China that are happening in the U.S. So definitely, for entrepreneurs in the room, it's definitely anything that you do today, you cannot ignore. You know, that anything you're developing is going to have to have some sort of Chinese flavor. And lastly, you know, obviously, the current environment, you know, combined with the industry that we're in, mobility, applications, et cetera, you know, makes this being a great place for entrepreneurs. So what I want to, you know, I'm going to be certain that next year I'm going to be sitting where you're sitting, you know, potentially listening to you talk about what innovation you have done and how you've been able to transform your company. So if anybody has any questions, you know, happy to answer any questions right now or I'll be, you know, walking around, you know, here for the next couple of days and happy to take any questions. So thanks for your time. Marcelo will take some, uh... Sorry, Marcelo will take some questions right now. As, uh... Go for it, sir. Excuse me. Gentleman right here. Uh, Marcello, good afternoon. My name is Aki Anastasio. I'm from South Africa. Great presentation. Um, and of course, you have a massive distribution hub in, so in South Africa. But what is your um, outlook and what, is your, what, are your, what are your thoughts on Africa and what's happening in Africa where you have six of the world's fastest growing economies situated in sub-Saharan Africa? Where do you see the future in your eyes? I mean, I, th I think Africa, when you look at our industry, I mean, I think the operators in Africa have done a great job. When you look at, you know, Africa is one of the first places in the world where mobility surpassed fixed line, and that's definitely an indication that there's a tremendous adoption of new technology. So I look at, you know, this last year, last couple of years have been the years of Latin America, and I think finally the time has come for Africa, you know, to continue to grow, to, ex to continue with that economic growth that there is and nothing better than with the adoption of new technologies. I mean, you're going to see Africa continue to replicate what has been successful markets like South Africa. And then when you look at just the, the quantity of mobile phones that are being shipped into Africa and the potential for markets <coughs> like Nigeria that places among the top 10 markets in the world, you know, for all of us that are developing new products or new services or new innovations, you know, nobody can ignore Africa and the potential growth by the sheer amount of people that are living in Africa today and how quickly they've been able to adopt technology. I mean, when you look at messaging in South Africa alone, you know, it's an incredible example of, you know, South Africa was one of the most important markets for BlackBerry and the amount of connectivity, the amount of BBMs that were being sent among South Africans rank among the world's 
uh, largest. So definitely uh, somewhere where we are investing. You know, we are, oh, we, I think we're in 13 different African countries and we're seeing the maturity of the market and we're seeing the adoption of new technology in many cases faster than other parts in the world. Thank you, Marshall. The gentleman here has had a question. Fourth row. What was like the best piece of advice you actually got while being an entrepreneur? I mean, I'll tell you, the best piece of advice is, you know, there's a lot of people who fail because, you know, they, they dream big and, and every, everybody wants to do this for the money. And I think at least what's worked for me is, is you know, as long as you know where you want to go, you know, money will come. I mean, I can tell you that never in my life when I started my business, I thought that somebody was going to pay me $1.25 billion for half my company. And I can tell you that everything that I did, I, I always did it, you know, never thinking of the money. You know, always thinking of you know, setting a clear goal and objective of where did I want to take this company and then take smaller steps. You know, when we started this business, our, our aspiration was we wanted to be the largest distribution company in Miami. And when we achieved that, we said, hey, we want to be the largest in Latin America. And then when we achieved that, we said we want to be the largest in the Americas. And then we said, you know, the hell with it. We want to be the largest in the world. And, you know, it was just calculated goals. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs fail today because, you know, they read in the newspaper, this company was sold for $3 billion, for $5 billion, for $7 billion, and people just do it for the money. And if money is your overall objective, I still I haven't met many people who have been able to sell their business for a lot of money who their main, main incentive is money. So just do it because you love what you do, put the passion to it, and you'll be successful and money will always come. Hello, uh, thanks. Um, it's really um, very good for me to listen to you because uh, we actually have developed one device that we think our company is going to change the smartphone uh, forever. And we are right in the point that we are looking for companies like yours. So my, my, my question will be how a really small company for like ours right now can, can get in touch with companies like yours and be noticed and actually don't be. How can we product demos to companies like you and what is your advice to a small company like, like ours? Anytime any somebody develops a product that's gonna change the smartphones, we're interested. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that we do is we have a whole group that focuses on new business development and you know we have teams that are always scouting for what are the new, you know, what are the greatest new products, the greatest new innovations. And what we do is, you know, we're very selective but once we find that product, I mean, we sell our products in 125 different countries. We ship to more than 125,000 points of sale every single day. We're shipping our products all over the world. But what we want to make sure is that, you know, we choose and we select the right product. So love, you know, love to see what you have and then see if there's an opportunity. Thanks. Any other questions? Any other questions? Great. All right. Thank well, you very much, Marcelo, for, for a very insightful presentation there.